My friend Andrew and I had known each other for years. We met at work when he started with the company that I had been with for over a year and became fast friends. Over time, we started hanging out a lot, camping and fishing, and talking about philosophy and religion, our two favorite subjects to debate. About a year and a half ago, he discovered a new hobby, geocaching. At first, I was a little annoyed at his excitement for what he called caching, but soon I began to enjoy it right along with him. After a couple of months, we had both become pretty good at finding the hidden stashes, and we were looking for a challenge. One day in October, I was sitting at my desk working on a report when Andrew walked up to me with a sly grin. Hey buddy. He seemed to be trying to contain a level of excitement that I had not seen in him before. Uh, what's up? I asked slowly, knowing that he only had that look when a crazy idea had found its way into his head. I found a cache I think we should do this weekend. There is a small catch though, he said. Well, now you have my attention. So there's a type of cache that's meant to be found at night. This one in particular is in a forest about 70 miles from here. You have to use a flashlight and follow a series of reflectors to find the final location where the cache is hidden. By this point, I was both skeptical and excited. I had never been one to go charging through the woods in the middle of the night, especially in a place I had never been. This cache, however, sounded like a lot of fun. When do you want to go? I asked. I was thinking maybe this weekend. My wife's sister is in town and I need to get out of the house, he replied. I'm game, I said. I could use a night out too, and it sounds like this will be an adventure for the ages. The rest of the week was spent planning and preparing for the trip. Flashlights were checked, bags were packed with water and medical supplies. We always overpacked, even for normal hiking excursions, just in case. We left Saturday afternoon, and after about a two hour drive, we found ourselves in a small parking lot at the edge of a forest. The sun had just gone down and twilight was starting to set in. The air was crisp and cool, but still warm for October. After some final checks of our gear, we put on our packs and set out on the trail. Based on our assessment and prior logs from people who had found the cache, we figured it would be about two hours round trip. Had we known what the night would hold, we would have gotten back in the car and left. We had been following the reflective tacks used to mark the right trail on the trees for about 30 minutes. They had been set up in a simple order. A single tack on one tree and two on the next, back to a single tack and so on like that. I was following Andrew since he had the brighter light out of the two of us when suddenly he stopped dead in his tracks. Jeremy, he said, his voice sounding more shaky than I expected. Yeah, buddy, what's up? The last tacks we saw were a set right? He asked, keeping his light on a tree in the distance. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were. Why? I was starting to worry, though I also assumed he was trying to prank me as he had made a pastime out of messing with me. I'm not sure, but I think I see another set up there. I walked up next to him to see what he was seeing. Sure enough, there appeared to be two tacks about 50 feet ahead of us, 10 feet or so up in the tree. That's odd. Maybe we missed a single one somewhere? I said even though we were both sure we would have seen it. The tacks had been spaced evenly to this point, and in the same order from the beginning. We decided to backtrack, making sure we hadn't missed anything. After about 15 minutes, we found our way back to the previous set and saw that there were in fact two, and we hadn't missed any singles along the way. After a brief discussion, we decided to push on and figured that the cash owner must have just missed something during setup or maybe one had fallen out of the tree where it was supposed to be. We walked back down the trail toward the set of tracks that we had stopped at, ready to just move on and forget about it. When we got to the spot where we had stopped before, we were shocked to see the set of tacks was now missing. Where did they go? He asked, his voice cracking. Maybe we just got off on the wrong trail or something. I was trying to sound convincing, but I knew my voice wasn't showing much confidence. Jeremy, there's only one trail. There's literally no other trail we could have branched off on. See that tree right there? He pointed his light at an oddly shaped tree. That is the exact tree that we saw the last time we were in this spot. I knew he was right. The tree stuck out like a sore thumb, and I remembered it very well. At this point, we were both uneasy. I know it sounds dumb, but neither of us were accustomed to being in the woods at night. We lived in a big city with lights everywhere, 
So the darkness was unsettling, to say the least. I'm going to go a little ways further and see if I see any other tacks. If not, maybe we should head back to the car and call it a night, I said as bravely as I could. After all, I figured, the biggest animal out here was a coyote, so there was not really anything to be too worried about. All right, you do that. I'm going to step over here and answer nature's call real quick. Just shout if you find anything. With that, I set off down the trail, not wanting to stick around for the details. I had only gone about 20 feet or so, just enough to see a little bit around the upcoming bend, when my eye caught a glimmer of light. A reflector. This was a single reflector, only a few feet away from where we thought we had seen the set earlier. I walked a little further to be sure it was a single one, and then turned around and shouted out to Andrew to let him know I had found it. Hey Andrew, I found the tack, I shouted. No answer. I waited a couple of minutes and shouted again, but again I was met with silence. I went back to where he had been and began searching both sides of the trail, thinking maybe he had fallen or was somehow incapacitated and unable to respond to my calls. After a few minutes of searching to no avail, I remembered that he and I shared our locations on our phones with each other just in case of emergency. I pulled my phone out and opened the map app. Service was slow but it was there. After a couple of minutes of loading, I was looking at his location on my phone and confusion quickly set in. The location data seemed to say his phone had just pinged 30 seconds prior, over a mile away. It had to be a glitch. There was no way he traveled a mile in less than three minutes in the woods at night. I decided to try and call and see if I could hear his ringer, sure that the GPS was glitching out. As soon as I heard the ringing on my end, I turned my volume down and listened for his ringtone. There was nothing but silence. At this point, I realized that I was in the middle of the woods, alone, in the dark. The next logical thing to do was follow the last reported signal of his phone and see where it led me. I reopened the map app, only to find that his signal was now showing him a half a mile away in the opposite direction. That's impossible, I said to myself, jumping at the sound of my own voice. Keeping the app open, I decided to start heading toward his location, keeping a close eye on the map. After about 15 minutes, I reached the location and began searching for him or his phone. Looking around and seeing nothing but darkness, I decided the best thing to do would be to head back to the trail and call the authorities to start a search. I was out of options and my cell coverage was almost non-existent. Suddenly, something hard hit me in the forehead. It took me a minute to realize what had happened and get my bearings. My head was pounding and with my hand I could feel a bump and a slight trickle of blood. Once I snapped back to my senses, I used my flashlight to look around and within a second I saw what had hit me. Andrew's phone was lying on the ground a couple of feet away. I picked it up and found the screen was cracked, but it was still on and the camera was recording a video. I hit the stop button and the thought hit me that he must be trying to mess with me. Ha ha, you got me. That was a good one. It's time to come out now though so we can get out of here. I expected to see him come out from behind a tree, laughing and gloating at his practical joke. But I received no response. I decided to play him at his own game. Alright, I'm going to start browsing through your pictures. Maybe even post those pictures you have of that night we went to Vegas on Facebook. Still nothing. I opened the photo app and began scrolling through his photos. He told me about some pictures he had that I knew he wouldn't want to getting out, and I figured if he saw me actually going through them, he would walk out and give up. The first thing in this album was a video, the one the phone had been capturing when it hit me in the head. I hit play, figuring I would catch him throwing it at me, but what I saw was something that shook me to the core. The video started with Andrew whispering about how he was going to get me good. He switched the camera around to show me off in the distance the light from my flashlight barely visible. I was not ready for what I saw when he switched the camera back around to his face. The light from his flashlight was lighting him up, but it was also showing something standing behind him. Before I knew what was happening, the thing grabbed him and the camera turned around, the ground approaching quickly before complete darkness took over. In the video, I could hear noises, but I couldn't make out exactly what the noises were. A sudden fear engulfed me, and I felt like I was in immediate danger. I began running back toward the trail, dropping the phone as I went. As soon as I found the path, I followed it as fast as I could all the way back to the parking area. 
Once inside the car, I called 911. I must have sounded like a crazy person to the operator, telling her that a monster had taken my friend out in the woods. The police arrived within 45 minutes, giving me plenty of time to worry that it would be coming for me next. I explained to the officer why I was there and what had happened. He kept asking me about the blood on my clothes and I kept insisting we needed to get a search party out there with the biggest guns they could muster and find the monster that had taken my friend. At first light, they had a group searching and it wasn't too long before they found the body. It appeared Andrew had been stabbed multiple times and his phone was nowhere to be found. I was taken from the area in the back of a police car, under arrest for murder. No one believes my story, but they do agree that a monster killed my friend.